gross indecencies, Oscar's trial, imprisonment and death in exile. Welcome to our fifth online production on the life and legacy of Oscar Wilde. To those returning, and I see many faces, thank you for joining us again this week. To those visiting us for the first time, you're all very welcome. I'm Christine Keneally, Director of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University. In last week's programme, we looked at Oscar's most successful period of writing from 1890 to 1895. Today, our focus is on Oscar's private life, his three trials, imprisonment, exile and death. All pretty harrowing stuff. Today, we will be welcoming our special guest, Colm O'Gorman, a human rights activist and executive director of Amnesty International Ireland. More about Colm later. And we also have three brilliant actors lined up. Firstly, Colin. Colin, we're delighted that you have returned to our program. Have you had a haircut? No. <laughs> Looking very young Oscar-ish. Okay. <laughs> Colin is a noted New York actor. On Broadway, he has appeared in Waiting for Godot and No Man's Land, and his TV and film appearances include Blue Blood, Shade of Blue, The Tap, Rockaway Moon, The Last Laugh, and The Sonnet Project. Colin is a graduate of the Academy for Classical Acting. Colin, welcome back. Thank you. And also returning to read Lord Alfred Douglas is James Evans, who read the part of Speranza's gifted son in part two of this series. James is a graduate of the American Academy of Dramatic Arts and of the University of Cambridge. James has appeared, amongst other things, at the Edinburgh, Fr Edinburgh Festival Fringe, or is it Fringe Festival? But anyway, we know what we mean. Okay, welcome back, James. We're delighted you're with us. And today, a new friend, Tim Ruddy, actor, director, and playwright. Tim has acted in a wide range of plays at the Irish Repertory Theatre, the Irish Arts Centre, the Manhattan Theatre Club in New York, and the Abbey Theatre in Dublin. He has directed two hit theatre productions at the Irish Rep. Over the years, he has appeared in and directed numerous television and film productions. His play, The International, won Best Play at Origin's first Irish Theatre Festival in 2013. Tim, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah. So, Oscar might have said, but more eloquently, we do have an embarrassment of riches because today we're also joined by Caroline Callery, director of the Irish Heritage Trust and the National Famine Museum in Strokestown in County Roscommon. I'm delighted that my institute is a partner with the museum in Strokestown. Please visit their website to see the fantastic work that the museum does, including but not exclusively, the National Famine Way. Caroline, you are so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure as always, Christine. Uh, so, and at this point, I'd like to introduce you to my co-curator, Matthew Squirt. Matthew, we have quite a lineup today. Yes, um, thank you, Christine, and thank you um, again for being here. I'm coming to you from Rochester, beautiful Rochester. It's actually very lovely out today. Um, <clears throat> and it's just a pleasure to be here. Um, and I think I echo you in, in um, just describing how, how much we have to get through, but also I think just the, the wonderful people um, and guests that we have on here. Uh, and just again, a brief just note about how this came to be. Um, now we're obviously all on Zoom. Um, this initially started uh, between Christine and I at Quinnipiac University as an exhibit on Oscar Wilde. Unfortunately, as, as coronavirus has, has done and continues to do, um, it's kind of waylaid us and now we are on Zoom, but I think we also get to reach a, a lot of um, more people this way and I think it's more interesting and, um, and also kind of uh, continually fascinating. So thank you again. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. And you know, as Matthew says, we sort of reimagined um, what we could do with our Oscar exhibition. And we never, I think, thought we would be doing six programs, but here we are, program five. And as we said, program five is Gross Indecencies, Oscar's Trial, Imprisonment and Death in Exile. So just to go back to Oscar's genius, in the early 1890s, Oscar was at the height of his creativity as a critic, as a novelist, as a writer of folklore and fairy tales and of society plays. He also wrote a serious play in 1891, Salome, about John the Baptist, which he wrote in French. Because of the subject matter, the play was banned in Britain. In the same year, 1891, Oscar met Lord Alfred Douglas, Bosey the third son of the Marquis of Queensbury. Bosey, a 21-year-old student at Oxford University, was a budding poet. 
He was also beautiful, willful, and petulant. Oscar, in the Hellenic tradition of an older man loving a beautiful younger man, was besotted and inspired. But Bosey introduced Oscar to the underbelly of late Victorian society, one of rent boys and opium dens. And so began a fateful journey. James, could you read Bosey's poem, Two Loves Please, written in September, 1892? I dreamed I stood upon a little hill, and as I stood and marveled, lo, across the garden came a youth, one hand he raised to shield him from the sun, his wind-tossed hair, and he came near me with his lips uncurled and kind, and caught my hand and kissed my mouth. What is thy name? He said. My name is Love. Then straight the first did turn himself to me, and cried, He lieth, for his name is Shame, but I am Love. And I was wont to be alone in this fair garden till he came unasked by night. I am true love. I fill the hearts of boy and girl with mutual flame. Then, sighing, said the other, have thy will. I am the love that dare not speak its name. Thank you very much. And um, this poem was often attributed incorrectly to Oscar. In fact, it was Bosey. Matthew, can you offer any insights into the relationship between Oscar and Bosey? Yeah, uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, you know, the relationship is, uh, you know, uh, I, I think a continuing theme that we have in Oscar um, and talking about him is complication. Uh, and, and I think you could look at, you know, his relationship with, with um, Bosey, Al Alfred Lord Douglas, as that kind of relationship. Um, as Christine alluded to, they meet in 1891. Um, and you really get a sense of a kind of roller coaster romance um, in that they're they're constantly, you know, together and in love, and then they get apart, and then they come back together again. Um, another case being when um, Bosey uh, was unfortunately given the task of translating um, into English uh, his Salome, um, the, the play that Christine just mentioned earlier, um, and it was actually a very horrible translation. Um, and there was actually a, a, a a falling out between him and, and Wilde at that point. Um, later in 1894, they come back together um, and, you know, and they continue this kind of, um, kind of roller coaster, um, complicated by the fact of the Marquess of Queensberry, which was Alfred Lord Douglas, Lord Alfred Douglas's father, um, who we'll, we'll talk more about later. Um, but I do think that it's inter it's important to keep in context of what's happening during Wilde's life at this point. And I think usually we tend to look at Bosey as, as kind of immature or, uh, you know, someone that's, you know, kind of feeding off Wilde and a kind of villain if, you know, Wilde's you know, life was a play. Um, but you also have to, you know, think that between 1891 and 1895, during the relationship, Wilde was at the height of his fame. He was at the height of, of his plays and things like that. So it's not just, you know, looking at it from a kind of villainous, you know, aspect of, of, of Alfred Lord Douglas. Um, it seems that, you know, this love, you know, the love that dare not speak its name seemed to inspire Wilde um, just as much as it caused headaches, I think, for, for him, you know, both personally and professionally, so. Okay, thank you, Matthew. So here is Marquis of Queensbury, Bosey's father. The Marquis of Queensbury was known to be an unpleasant and belligerent character. Angered by his son's relationship with Oscar, he left a calling card at Oscar's London club, reading, it says, and here it is, for Oscar, Oscar Wilde posing Sondermite. Is this the most famous spelling error ever? Oscar, egged on by Bosey, sued for criminal libel, leading to Queensbury's arrest. Queensbury's lawyers were headed by barrister Edward Carson. And if you know anything about Edward Carson, he was born in Dublin, attended Trinity College at the same time as Oscar. So they had been friends. So Carson, a fellow Irishman, presented Oscar as a promiscuous older man who had seduced innocent young boys into a life of degenerate homosexuality. Oscar dropped the libel case when Carson threatened to call several male prostitutes to testify that they had had sex with Oscar. Tim, could you read Edward Carson's defense? And Carson is speaking this to the jury, please. <clears throat> yep, 
before you condemn Lord Queensbury, I ask you to read Mr. Wilde's poem and say whether the gorge of any father ought not to rise. I ask you to bear in mind that Lord Queensbury's son was so dominated by Mr. Wilde that he threatened to shoot his own father. The wonder is not that this man Wilde should have been tolerated in London for the length of time he was. Well, I shall prove that Mr. Wilde brought boys into the Savoy Hotel. As to the boy Conway, Conway was not procured by Taylor. He was procured by Wilde himself. Has there ever been confessed in a court of justice a more audacious story than that confessed by, to Mr., to, by Mr. Wilde in relation to Conway? He met the boy, he said, on the beach at Worthing. He knew nothing whatsoever about him except that he assisted in launching the boats. Conway's real story is that this, he sold newspapers at Worthing at the kiosk on the pier. If the evidence was true, and I sincerely hope it is not, Conway was introduced to Mrs. Wilde and her two sons, aged nine and ten. Now it's clear Mr. Wilde could not take the boy Conway in the condition he found him, so what did he do? And it is here that the disgraceful audacity of the man comes in. Mr. Wilde procured the boy a suit of clothes to dress him up like a gentleman's son and put some public school colors upon his hat and generally make him look like a lad fit and proper to associate with Mr. Oscar Wilde. The whole thing in its audacity is almost past belief. If Mr. Wilde were really anxious to assist Mr. Conway, the very worst thing he could have done was to take the lad out of his proper sphere to begin by giving him champagne luncheons, taking him to his hotel, and treating him in a manner in which the boy could never in the future be expected to live. Thank you, Tim. I think the line, take the lad out of his proper sphere, is very telling for the whole class dimension that underpins this as well. So, Queensbury was acquitted, but he sent the evidence collected by his detectives to Scotland Yard, which resulted in two more trials, this time with Oscar in the stand. The first jury could not reach a conclusion. The second charged and convicted Oscar of gross indecency under the recently passed Criminal Law Amendment Act. Matthew, could you explain the context in which these three separate trials took place? Yes, so the, you know, the thing about, I think, the Oscar Wilde trial is that they're actually plural trials, that there's um, three of them. Um, and the irony is that, that Wilde, um, in a way, brought, brought this upon himself. Uh, if you read a lot of his writings, even before this, there seems to be this, this kind of martyrdom or this kind of idea of tempting fate, you know. Um, and, and really, you could see that um, with what Wilde does, is that one, once the Earl of Queensberry, um, or the Queens, uh, Mar Marquis of Queensberry comes to um, the, the premiere of uh, the importance of being earnest and, and you know, calls him opposing Somdomite, he brings a charge of libel um, against him. Um, and now, you know, I'm not big into, you know, looking at um, the 19th century court cases, but libel in particular was very difficult to actually prove. Um, there was a famous case about, at about 10 years before this between James McNeil Whistler and Ruskin, where uh, Ruskin had written a very bad review of one of um, Whistler's paintings, uh, and it went to court, and it was actually very expensive. Whistler actually ended up winning that, but he only gained a farthing, um, and was bankrupt for the rest of his life. So again, it's not very easy um, to actually get a, a charge of, of libel um, prosecuted. Um, and as you see with the trial in that, um, you know, at first Wilde is very Wildean um, in that he's theatrical and he's very kind of petulant and treating the, the, um, the, the first trial as, as a kind of show, uh, you know, with him as the star. Uh, and then things start to turn is that they start bringing up more, um, you know, kind of his quote unquote rent boys, uh, other charges um, of gross indecency, as, as Christine mentioned. Um, and then that quickly is thrown out the first trial. He's retried in a second trial. That trial goes forward, but does not actually get him 
you know, it, it, he essentially um, is, is a hung jury that the jury can't come up with um, a charge against him. And then they retry him in a third trial. And that is the trial that ultimately ends in his going to prison uh, for two years. So again, it's a very kind of complicated, but also kind of very interesting um, court case in that it's, you know, talked about today as, as kind of just one trial, but I think um, it, it's a bit more, again, complicated than, than we, we tend to, to, to remember. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thank you, Matthew. So, the second trial, Oscar was convicted and given the maximum sentence allowed, which was two years hard labour. So, could you, Tim, please read Judge Willis's statement at the end of the trial? It is the worst case I have ever tried. I shall pass the severest sentence that the law allows. In my judgment, it is totally inadequate for such a case as this. The sentence of the court is that you be imprisoned and kept to hard labor for two years. Thank you, Tim. So at this point, I'd like to introduce our very special guest, Colm O'Gorman. Colm hails from Wexford, where of course Speranza's family came from. Colm is the executive director of Amnesty International Ireland, a non-governmental organization focusing on human rights. And Amnesty, of course, has its origins in Ireland. I think as long ago as the 1860s, with Isaac Butt coming up through Maud Garn and her son, Sean McBride. Amnesty's campaign supports refugees and asylum seekers. It is opposed to torture and capital punishment. Colm also founded One in Four, an Irish charity which supports men and women who have been sexually abused or suffered sexual violence. And this is something that Colm can speak of from a very personal place. Colm represented the Progressive Democrats in the Irish Senate. Colm, you are very welcome. So Colm, could you tell us about Amnesty, which is very much, I would say, grounded in traditional Irish views of social justice? Can you explain Amnesty's role in the world today and your contribution to it? Sure. Well, Amnesty was founded actually in, in 1961 um, by uh, its, its origin story is, is grounded in, um, there was a UK lawyer called Peter Benison, who, upon reading of the imprisonment of political prisoners in Portugal, was so offended by the notion that people could be imprisoned for their beliefs or for their views. He wrote an article in the, in the Observer newspaper in May of 1961, calling for an, an international campaign for what he called the release of prisoners of conscience. And the response to that, to that article um, was uh, so uh, positive and so effusive that it led to the establishment of Amnesty International, a global organization that campaigned for the release of uh, prisoners of conscience, people who were imprisoned for their, for their political or other views. Um, and uh, Amnesty Ireland was one of the seven founding what we call national sections or chapters of the global movement. And in fact, the first ever chairperson of Amnesty was former uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Nobel Laureate Sean McBride, uh, um, another Irishman. So yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a long history, but of course, I suppose the first ever international human rights organization was founded by another celebrated Irishman, uh, Roger Casement, um, on foot of his work on the Congo when he, he founded um, an association to campaign for um, uh, the human rights of those who are experiencing violations in the Congo as part of uh, Leopold's adventures there and of the rubber industry there. Okay. Uh, can we just turn back to Oscar and when did you first become aware of him and how would you characterize him? Well, I mean, like anybody growing up in Ireland, I, 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 growing up, I would have heard of Oscar as a great writer, as a literary figure. Um, but uh, at the time that I was growing up in Ireland, the, the aspects of his life, his sexuality, his downfall, his, uh, his death, those weren't things that were discussed because we didn't talk about such things in Ireland in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, so uh, Oscar in, in, in my early life was celebrated as a, a very great writer and great wish, um, but those aspects of his life um, were never really discussed. I think it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that you know, we're having this conversation, it's actually 27 years ago today that Ireland decriminalized homosexuality. So the 24th of, of June, uh, 1993. Um, so I wonder what Oscar would have made of that at this stage, given what he had to say at the time about what he foresaw as a long battle um, to try to secure or end uh, um, the, the, the targeting and criminalization of people 
uh, because of who they loved. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as a as a as a, a gay man growing up in, in Ireland, I mean, I, I saw somebody in the chat mentioning about Oscar wearing a green carnation. So there was a time when you know any mention of Oscar had that uh, connotation to it that it was it was certainly part of Irish gay culture even the 1980s. So Oscar was one of the people that was talked about and celebrated very often in 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 rather two dimensional terms. So the green carnation was a symbol. You know, there would have been places or, or, or social events that were named after him. So he was certainly owned and claimed by the, the, the gay community here in Ireland as it was in the 1970s and 1980s as they began or as we began to campaign uh, for um, an end to criminalisation and for greater equality. Yeah, I actually, I know we're joined by somebody who's very active, I don't know if she wants to be called out, but very active in Dublin in the 1970s, 1980s. I myself was a student in Dublin, so I remember those days very, very well indeed. So thank you for reminding us how recent it was. So do you think um, in the past programmes we've talked about Oscar's politics, and um, particularly his flirtation with Home Rule, his support for Charles Stuart Parnell, his feminism. Uh, if Oscar was a while alive today, do you think he would be an activist? It's hard to imagine that he wouldn't be, isn't it? Given how much he pushed the boundaries. And of course, he didn't just push the boundaries because of um, uh, um, exposés, uh, you know, of, of, of scandals that resulted from, from, and the investigations that resulted from his own challenging uh, of the Marcus of Queensbury. And um, he pushed the boundaries in, in most things that he did and said. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Oscar was an activist at the time. I mean, I think any intellectual, any public intellectual or, or, or public commentator, and um, if they're grounded in reflecting what's happening around them, they, there's always an element of activism, isn't there? I mean, isn't art at its, at, its, at its core about presenting a picture of society back to itself to provoke very often some kind of exploration or response from, from society? So I think the artist is very often commenting on and challenging society. Um, you know, as we've seen, he certainly did that in many ways, many levels, as did his mother um, in her own way. So, Matthew, at this point, do you have a question or questions for Colin? Yeah, um, one of the questions I was thinking, it's, it's again rather topical today, but, you know, thinking of Wilde and, and kind of his post, you know, getting out of prison and the idea of kind of prison reform um, and how that kind of plays into, you know, now, I mean, in, in America right now, that's, you know, the big hot button issue, prison reform, uh, police, things like that. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to maybe, you know, what, what Amnesty is, has done or, or is doing in terms of, uh, you know, that kind of, uh, that kind of reform, or it's kind of maybe it's history of prison reform, you know, thinking back to, to Wilde, and, and you mentioned Roger Casman, um, et cetera. Well, I mean, the, the origins of the organization uh, were, were grounded in a response to the imprisonment of or the criminalization of dissent, right, of nonviolent dissent. Um, and then obviously, uh, as the organization focused on the full range and spectrum of rights, there was a strong focus initially on civil and political rights. So there was a strong concern for the first or an overwhelming concern for the first, you know, three or four decades, well, three decades, certainly of the organization's existence on civil and political rights, so on issues that had to do with liberty, on detention, on fair trial, uh, on death penalty, on all of those issues. But yes, on, on, on prison conditions as well. Um, so we, we continue to focus on those issues. I know in the United States, for instance, right now, there's, there's obviously a strong focus on, on discrimination within the criminal justice system. So the, the very alive uh, um, and vital conversations that's happening in the United States now on issues relating to race and the targeting of uh, people of color, particularly uh, black men in the context of the criminal justice system is something that the organization has been focused on for quite some time and will continue to be very focused on. So it is a, a very large concern for us. Okay, Matthew, any more questions or uh, no? No, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Colm, uh, do you mind if we move on for now, but will you stay with us in case we have more questions later? Sure, of course. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Oscar, as we heard, was imprisoned under the harshest conditions possible. Throughout the three trials, he had protected Bosey, and as the following letter suggests, he remained devoted to him. This is Oscar writing to Lord Alfred Douglas on the 29th of April, 1895. He is in Holloway Prison. Colin, could you read this, please? My dearest boy, this is to assure you of my 
immortal, my eternal love for you. Tomorrow, all this will be over. If prison and dishonor be my destiny, think that my love for you and this idea, this still more divine belief that you love me in return will sustain me in my unhappiness and will make me capable, I hope, of bearing my grief most patiently. Since the hope, nay, the certainty of meeting you again in some world is the goal and the encouragement of my present life, ah, I must continue to live in this world because of that. Dear came to see me today. I gave him several messages for you. He told me one thing that reassured me that my mother should never want for anything. I have always provided for her subsistence and the thought that she might have to suffer, suffer privations was making me unhappy. As for you, graceful boy with a Christ-like heart, as for you. I beg you, as soon as you have done all you can, leave for Italy and regain your calm and uh, write those lovely poems which you do with such a strange grace. Do not expose yourself to England for any reasons whatsoever. Our love has always been beautiful and noble. And if I have been the butt of a terrible tragedy, it is because the nature of that love has not been understood. Dearest boy, sweetest of all young men, most loved and most lovable, oh, wait for me, wait for me. I am now, as ever, since the day we met, yours devotedly and with an immortal love, Oscar. Thank you, Colin. And if any of you don't know what hard labour is, in late Victorian society, hard labour mostly represented working on a treadmill. And for Oscar's first few months in prison, he was actually chained to a treadmill, as you see, and he worked on it for six hours a day. At one point he fell off and damaged his right side, but he was refused medical treatment. So it was very, very harsh punishment indeed. So, Constance. Constance, regardless of all she and her children had gone through, remained loyal to Oscar. She returned from her exile in Europe to visit him in prison, despite it being a difficult and harrowing experience. Constance shared these experiences with Robert Sherrod and with Lady Mount Temple in two letters written in September and October 1895. Caroline, could you read them, please? My dear Mr. Sherrod, it was indeed awful, more so than I had any conception that it could be. I, I could not see him, I could not touch him, and I scarcely spoke. Come to me before you go to him on Monday. At any time after two, I can see you. For when I go again, I am to get at the Home Secretary through Mr. Haldine and to try and get a room to see him in and touch him again. He has been mad the last three years and he says that if he saw Lord A again, he would kill him. So he had better stay away and be satisfied with having marred a fine life. Few people can boast of so much. I thank you for your kindness to a fallen friend. You are kind and gentle to him. And you are, I think, the only person he can bear to see. Constance. And the second letter is Constance to Lady Mount Temple. Caroline, could you read that, please? I saw him, only as one is allowed by special permission to see any prisoner, but I really could not go through it again. There were two gratings and a passage between us, and thus we had to speak. 
It was awful. More awful than anything I've ever been through. And worse even, I suppose, for him. I came over to London for five days only to see him. But the next time, I shall word my request differently. And in a month's time, I hope to see him face to face. Though even so, there must be a warden present all the time. Constance. Thank you, Caroline. So at this point, can I turn to Talo and ask, are there any questions, Talo? Yes, we got lots of questions. Okay. Lots, lots of questions about Constance. Uh, what did she know? When did she know it? Did she approve of Oscar's homosexuality? Christine, I'll, you and Matthew maybe want to take that. Okay. Um, it's certainly, she, what she did know is that after 1891, Oscar was spending less and less time at the family home. And increasingly, his relationship with Bosey was quite public. Um, we heard from the evidence read by Carson earlier that some of the people Oscar was meeting with came to his family home, met his children. So she was, a, we, as we've discussed, she was a highly intelligent woman, very worldly. So she must have known something was going on. Um, but what seems to come through from what Caroline has just read and Constance said, that she remained loyal, devoted, and I would say in love with him. But Matthew, can you add anything? Yeah, um, you know, just in terms of uh, that relationship, I mean, she did meet uh, Lord Alfred Douglas on numerous occasions. She knew that, you know, he existed. Um, I'm, I'm hesitant to, you know, kind of, you know, talk about his homosexuality and that how much was he, um, you know, would he adhere to what we would consider today as homosexuality? I mean, it's completely different. It didn't even exist really in, in you know, psychology. I think the first time it was listed in a psychology textbook was like 1895, which would be around this time, um, which is not to say that, you know, she wasn't at the same time, I think, very lonely. And we talked about her, um, you know, briefly a, a few uh, episodes ago um, in terms of how she struggled with that. Um, but I do think at the same time, you know, there's evidence to suggest, as I, as I mentioned a few episodes ago, that she did stay um, very close to him um, and actually, you know, um, helped him on a lot of his plays in terms of, you know, editing them, looking them over, things like that. So again, it's a very complicated relationship. And, uh, you know, today we would think, oh, he, she could have just divorced him and, and, you know, kind of gone her own way. Um, but again, divorce, that, that whole idea was not was not really even practiced at that time. Of course, people got divorced. It was much, um, very much um, expensive. And, and again, there was a degree of social ostracism that came with that. So, um, so again, but I, a good question. And, and it's one that, you know, I think critics, historians have kind of gone over and looked at um, on numerous occasions. So. Yeah, and just also Constance supported Oscar financially, which again, you know, tells you something about how she regarded him. Right, we have a question also for Colm. Uh, Colin, one of the one of uh, of the viewers asks, uh, would Wilde today, like in terms of amnesty, what when he fled to France, would that be seen as a sort of, uh, would he be seen as a refugee, as someone seeking asylum? Yeah, absolutely, Sherlock. I mean, uh, um, uh, you know. <laughs> On, on, the, on the face of it, uh, um, Oscar would certainly have qualified as a refugee. I think he said himself that he fled the United Kingdom or fled England once he was released from prison because it was not safe and he went to France because homosexuality wasn't criminalized there. So he was, he was fleeing what was clearly persecution um, and fleeing to a place of safety looking for protection. So he would have certainly um, in that context qualified as a refugee and um, persecution on the basis of sexual orientation is recognized as uh, um, cause uh, for the granting of uh, international protection now in refugee law. So yeah, absolutely. He was, he was undoubtedly a refugee and, and would be seen as one and considered one today. Thank you. Back to you, Christine. Okay, thank you, Talo. So prison robbed Oscar of so much, but he did have a last burst of creativity represented by De Profundus and the Ballad of Reading Jail, both now considered masterpieces of literature. Colm Tobin has described a profundus as one of the greatest love letters ever written. It was, of course, addressed to Lord Alfred Douglas. Let's hear a section of it 
read by Colin, please. I want to get to the point when I shall be able to say quite simply and without affectation that the two great turning points in my life were when my father sent me to Oxford and when society sent me to prison. I will not say that prison is the best thing that could have happened to me, or that phrase would savor of too great bitterness towards myself. I would sooner say, or hear it said of me, that I was so typical a child of my age that in my perversity, and for that perversity's sake, I turned the good things of my life to evil and the evil things of my life to good. What is said, however, by myself or by others, matters little. The important thing, the thing that lies before me, the thing that I have to do, if the brief remainder of my days is not to be maimed, marred, and incomplete, is to absorb into my nature all that has been done to me, to make it part of me, to accept it without complaint, fear, or reluctance. The supreme vice is shallowness. Whatever is realized is right. Society, as we have constituted it, will have no place for me, has none to offer. But nature, whose sweet rains fall on unjust and just alike, will have clefts in the rocks where I may hide, and secret valleys in whose silence I may weep undisturbed. She will hang the night with stars so that I may walk abroad in the darkness without stumbling and send the wind over my footprints so that none may track me to my hurt. She will cleanse me in great waters and with bitter herbs make me whole. Thank you, Colin. Oscar's time in prison also resulted in the Ballad of Reading Jail which ironically has proved to be his most successful poem and his final major work before his premature death. The ballad is about a soldier who kills his wife in a fit of rage and he is hanged for it. Tim will now read a selection of The Ballad of Reading Jail. He did not wear his scarlet coat for blood and wine or red and blood and wine were on his hands when they found him with the dead, the poor dead woman whom he loved and murdered in her bed. He walked amongst the trial men in a suit of shabby gray, a cricket cap on his head and his step seemed light and gay, but I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. I never saw sad men who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue we prisoners call the sky, and at every careless cloud that passed in happy freedom by. But there were those amongst us all who walked with downcast head and knew that had each got his due, they should have died instead. He had but killed a thing that lived, whilst they had killed the dead. In Reading Jail by Reading Town there is a pit of shame, and in it lies a wretched man eaten by teeth of flame and burning winding sheet he lies, and his grave has got no name. And there till Christ call forth the dead, in silence let him lie. No need to waste the foolish tear or heave the windy sigh. The man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. And all men kill the things they love. By all let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss, the brave man with a sword. Thank you, Tim. Matthew, can we read Reading Jail as a deeply personal poem? Or is it also an indictment of the so-called justice system in Victorian society? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the beauty of the poem, as we've just witnessed, is I think it's both. 
you know, I think within the context of his life, you, you get a sense of, you know, a, a completely different tone of Wilde here than, you know, if you read his plays, or even if you go as far back as his, his, his first work of poetry, um, which seemed, you know, at least the critics at the time said it was very imitative of romantic um, poets of Byron and Shelley, etc. Um, but here, I think you get a sense of just the kind of visceral realism um, of the poem, uh, you know, of not hiding any of the details of, of I think, the, the pain and the anguish um, of being incarcerated, um, which is why I think it still has um, a very, you know, powerful meaning um, as, as it's just being read today. Um, so again, I, I do think there's that, that interesting um, way that Wilde has about him of, you know, speaking about something very personal, but also, I think, widening it um, for, you know, any kind of occasion, particularly ones for social reform and, and things like that, so. Okay, and that ties back to what Colin was saying to us earlier. Why wouldn't he be an activist? Okay, thank you, Matthew. Wilde was released from prison on the 18th of May, 1897. He almost immediately sought exile in France. Before leaving though, he said goodbye to friends, visited his mother's burial place in London, and displaying his typical kindness, wrote a long letter to the press, imploring that children in prison should not be punished like adults. This is a letter from Oscar to the editor of the Daily Chronicle, dated the 27th of May, 1897, and read by Colin, please. Sir, I learn with great regret through the columns of your paper that the warder Martin of Reading Prison has been dismissed by the prison commissioners for having given some sweet biscuits to a little hungry child. I saw the three children myself on Monday preceding my release. They had just been convicted and were standing in a row in the central hall in their prison dress, carrying their sheets under their arms, previous to their being sent to the cells allotted to them. They were quite small children, the youngest, the one to whom the warder gave the biscuits, being a tiny little chap for whom they had evidently been unable to find clothes small enough to fit. I had, of course, seen many children in prison during the two years during which I was myself confined. Wandsworth Prison, especially, contained always a large number of children. But the little child I saw on the afternoon of Monday, the 17th at Reading, was tinier than any one of them. I need not say how utterly distressed I was to see these children at Reading, for I knew the treatment in store for them. The cruelty that is practiced by day and night on children in English prisons is incredible except to those who have witnessed it and are aware of the brutality of the system. Sir, your obedient servant, Oscar Wilde. Thank you, Colin. Um, can we go back to Talo? Any more questions, Talo? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions for both of you. Uh, first for Colin. Colin, your work, it's, it's been said that your work as one of the lead campaigners for marriage equality and the, the success of that in 2015 uh, really was all about a change of attitudes. And you have spoken in the past about the attitude in Ireland in general. But for you, it was a big surprise, even though you were leading the campaign or one of the leaders, that, that, that marriage equality went through. Could you talk a little bit about your feelings at that time? Sure, yeah, thanks, Sherlock. It, it, to be honest, it wasn't a surprise. Um, um, but what was a surprise was the, what it meant to people. And when I say people, I mean to, to Irish people generally, what it, what it seemed to mean to society. Um, all of the polls in the run-up to the referendum for about a year before the referendum suggested that a significant majority of people were supportive. But the big question for those of us who were campaigning and Amnesty and other partners were campaigning on this issue was, well, why would people feel motivated to go and vote? So, you know, there was a concern that the support was rather soft, you know, that people would be inclined to say, well, why shouldn't people get married if they want to? We agree that people shouldn't be discriminated against in terms of civil marriage law, and um, so let them get on with it. But whether people would feel that this was something that they felt um, that they were compelled to act to make happen. 
So um, for many of us, our, our challenge was, and, and our, our fear was that people wouldn't see the, 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 the bigger question, I suppose, that were being asked. And for me, as much as, as it was an important question personally, um, actually, I was, I was much more interested about what the response to the question might, might say about who we are as a people, about the kind of society we, we were, um, frankly, almost uh, proclaiming or manifesting, um, finally. Um, as opposed to the, the the specific question, you know, for me the the question wasn't so much about do you want two people of the same gender to be able to marry. Actually, the question was much more for me about do we believe that the committed, lifelong, loving relationships that we form with each other are the basis upon which we build our lives, our families, our society, and our republic. If we believe that, do we believe that we should cherish, respect, protect, and nurture those relationships and the families that result from those relationships? And if so. Do we, do we believe that we should extend that to everybody equally? Should there be, be limits based on issues like sexual orientation, for instance, to the protection that, 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 that we grant people? So really it was a question that was much more about much more than do we think that two men or two women should be able to marry? It was much more about what kind of society do we want to be? How do we manifest those values? Who do we see ourselves to be and how do we give expression to that? Um, and you know what was phenomenal about the about the result in many ways was 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 I mean it wasn't just the result I mean an overwhelming majority in favour, but it was also the degree to which the result was celebrated. I mean there are rare occasions where you see in a in a developed world context people taking to the streets to dance and celebrate, and um, when the outcome of a ballot is announced, and yet that's what happened all across Ireland, and it wasn't you know just people from the LGBT community were doing that. There was enormous celebration by so many people about the question that we had answered for ourselves collectively about who we were. Um, I think I've, I remember being on Morning Ireland when the, when the uh, um, on OT, on the main state broadcaster here, um, on the morning of the count, and within 30 minutes of the ballot boxes being opened for the count, the no side were conceding, and, and it was clear that it was going to be a significant victory uh, for the yes side. And, and the, the the journalist asked me, I was asked a question about, did I believe that this was evidence of a new and modern and outward looking Ireland? Was this an Ireland that was finally um, embracing modernity and looking forward? And I rejected that idea completely because I didn't believe that was the case. Instead, I said that I thought that this was evidence of an Ireland that had looked deep within itself and actually that had looked um, um, also to ancient traditions and understandings of family, of community, uh, of, our, of our responsibilities to each other, of our duty of care, of our common concern, and that it was an articulation of what were in, in ways very deep ancient values grounded in traditions, uh, and rather than us looking outwardly at the world and thinking what would the world make of us. Um, and I think that was one of the things that was, that was particularly positive about the outcome, was that it was, we were asked a question about ourselves and we answered it for ourselves without any concern about how the rest of the world might see it. Um, and of course, then a, a, a rather wonderful and amusing thing to see was, was the world looking at Ireland the day afterwards, the day of the result and kind of scratching its head and going, really, Ireland? Ireland did this? Ireland was the first country anywhere in the world by popular vote to not just permit uh, marriage equality for same-sex couples, but to require it at the level of its constitution. Ireland did this? And you saw many other countries then say, well, if they can do it, why aren't we having that conversation here? You saw that in Germany, you saw it in, in, in Australia, in many, many other countries. Um, so it had, a, it had a very significant impact beyond ourselves, but actually the conversation was very much, I think, for ourselves and about ourselves, which was why it was so rich. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we need to just move on, but- Thank you so much. Yeah, that was a brilliant- um, I have a question for you, Christine. Okay, quick one. After the mistrial, well, we've got five minutes here. After the mistrial, why did um, Wilde not flee the country and avoid the other trial? Um, Oscar could have fled at any point and his friends urged him to do so. And he decided that he would stay and fight it and take the consequences. But he had many, many opportunities to flee, but chose not to. And as Con said before, you know, France was the obvious choice because um, there had been decriminalization of homosexuality with the French Revolution, but he chose not to go. So I'm just going to move us on, executive decision here, if that's okay, thank you. So um, as we said, Oscar went into self-imposed exile in Europe, mostly France and briefly Italy. 
He relied almost exclusively on friends like Robert Ross and Constance for funds. He visited with Bosey on two occasions against the wishes of family and friends. He also visited the grave of the now dead Constance in Italy. Oscar died from meningitis and ironically the inflammation was caused by his fall when he was in prison and they had refused him treatment. He was baptized Catholic on his deathbed. Oscar was buried in the Cimitero de Bagno, but his remains were moved to Père Lachaise in 1909. And Matthew, we don't have much time, but can you just say Oscar's final years, were they a tragedy or a triumph? Yeah, again, that's a very um, difficult question, um, but I, I do think that there is, you know, real tragedy to his end, um, you know, uh, in that you look at the last years of his life, and as, as you point out, he was essentially destitute, you know, walking around Paris, um, you know, asking friends for money uh, at one, you know, and he was working, um, as we saw, uh, you know, with the Ballad of Reading Jail when that was released. But even after, um, he does actually, um, you know, look at look through the proofs of some of his old plays, the importance of being earnest. And he writes to Robbie Ross, he says, quote, I can write, but have lost the joy of writing. Um, which I think, you know, I think in some ways resonates with with just the, the mental kind of um, depression that he was under. Um, but I do really think, you know, in saying that it's a tragedy, I don't want to give the idea that it's, it's kind of some sensational tragedy, um, which is usually how it's viewed, um, you know, and that he did continue on, um, regardless of, you know, everything being against him. Um, and I think there is a resiliency to that, um, at least posthumously, um, and in terms of his legacy, which I think sets up nicely, um, you know, kind of tantalizingly um, our discussion for next week. So. Okay, thank you, Matthew. That's a great segue. Um, I know we are running out of time. So I just want to thank our readers, Colin Ryan, James Evan, Tim Ruddy, and Caroline Callery. You're all brilliant. This is our usual team. And a special thanks to our very special guest all the way from Wexford. Colm O'Gorman, thank you so much for joining us today and for your incredible insights. Thank you. We invite you all to join us for next Wednesday for program six, which will be our final program. And as Matthew said, we will hear about Oscar's legacies and why he retains a special place in so many people's hearts. And I think Matthew and I want to complete the series by having a toast to Oscar. More on that to follow. Next week, our special guest will be film director Peter Samuelson, whose body of work includes the wonderful film wild and here is peter i recommend if you haven't seen it please watch it or if you have seen it re-watch it and we will also have a virtual appearance by i meant to change that picture i apologize <laughs> uh, by civil rights activist professor david norris who was at trinity when i was at trinity so if you want more information go to our website geo.qu.edu stroke wild uh, but for now i just want to thank everyone who's joined us for everyone who's contributed to the show and just be safe be well and be kind thank you all very much thank you <laughs>